Hi, I'm Polyglot Dan, and I know many languages off and off the JVM. All right, here you go. And, and I'm Skeevy Dan, and I only know Java. All right. All right. Um, um, knowing new languages uh, lets me discover uh, a lot of new and different things that I could also, also use in Java uh, when, I, when I decide to use Java. And I, I know design patterns. All right. All right. <laughs> I have a vast number of tools at my disposal, a lot of them that have nothing to do with Java. Um, and uh, that makes me uh, more productive. Let me write that in Java. All right. Uh, knowing all five different languages on the JVM makes me more desirable for customers and, uh, and, and, uh, more, uh, and employers. So it makes me more profitable in the end. Scala and Clojure make me dizzy. All right, so, there, so there's my commercial. And uh, while they're trying to fix the uh, VGA here, I could try to do as much as I can um, just to, uh, um, you know, just to talk about what my central theme for this particular talk is. It's learning uh, the five new JVM languages, or not new, some of them have, are, are pretty old, but learning five JVM languages within the next five years. I notice a lot of uh, speakers out there uh, usually do a talk that tries to, I don't know, tries to change people. And I thought, oh, I, I don't like to do that. I, I, I don't like to intrude that much. But I thought I'd try my hand at this one because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea over the next five years to think about some of the new, uh, new ideas that come forth with, uh, with a few of these JVM languages. So I'm going to dare all of you to learn. Uh, you ready? Java 8. I mean, I know you use Java, but Java 8 has changed a lot of things about the way you think about using a language. That's the first one. The next one, uh, Clojure. Uh, the next one after that, well, it could be in any order that you want. Definitely learn five new languages in the next five years. The other one, let's see, Clojure, Scala, JRuby, and Groovy. So let me, uh, let me, just, uh, let me just poll the audience. How many of you know Java 8 now? Okay, small fraction, it looks like it's getting there. Um, how many of you are bound by your employers uh, to a certain Java version, usually because of licensing restrictions? That's amazing, that's a, that's a fairly good chunk. So uh, Java 8 changes a, a lot of things about how you design software, uh, particularly the use of lambdas. Um, there, I have another talk called uh, Walking TDD, I'm not doing it at this conference, uh, but it's a, uh, it's, it's based off of David Hanemeyer Hansen's um, blog post that TDD is dead. And um, Rubius, what are you going to do? They're all claiming things are dead. They, they claimed like 10 years ago that, uh, that Java was dead. <laughs> so they're always doing that. So he, de he declared, TDD is dead. We'll never be using uh, TDD ever again. We'll just stick with system testing. And um, during a YouTube chat about whether TDD is dead, um, David Hanemeyer Hansen kind of like backtracked a bit. Um, Kent Beck was there, the TDD proponent, and so was Martin Fowler. During, the, uh, during that particular podcast, uh, Kent Beck had mentioned, um, I don't do mocking. And I thought, wow, that, that's weird. He doesn't do mocking. And that was like plaguing me for a long time. Oh, is VGA back? Working as well. So I'll continue my story. So, um, so he said, I, I don't use mocks anymore. And I think some of you know what mocks are. And I thought, wow, this is really racking my brain. Why is it that he doesn't use mocks? Um, so I started thinking about it. And really, the answer is uh, to use functions. Uh, to use functions as a first class citizen. And you can manipulate your language to do whatever it is you need to do. So I thought that was very interesting into itself. And um, that's going to be probably the biggest highlight uh, for Java 8. And it's going to be important to understand that kind of functionality because other languages already have that other kind of functionality. In Groovy, how many of you know Groovy? That's a small percentage. I'm surprised by that. Um, Groovy is actually a beautiful language. Um, we had a uh, talk at another conference, uh, a Birds of a Feather, and someone had mentioned the only thing wrong with Groovy is likely the name. 
Uh, it, it sounds like something that you need to be in a drug-induced coma in order to, uh, to enjoy and be productive in. Uh, but it is actually a great language. Uh, it is dynamic, uh, dynamically typed. And out of all the other languages in the JVM, that's the one we're likely with the lowest learning curve. Uh, the idea behind Groovy is that you should be able to take Java code wholesale, take that code, rename the file .groovy, and you should be able to compile it in Groovy. Uh, by compiling it, it just compiles to the same bytecode. Um, or it's interpreted, you could just run uh, regular Groovy code and in the interpreter. So um, it's a great language, it's an easy language to learn. Some of the things that uh, I particularly like about Groovy is it makes uh, making lists, making sets a whole lot easier, making maps a whole lot easier. So it's definitely a language worth a try. I'm going to assume that if you ever take one of these languages on, I think that one's probably gonna be a, probably a six month type of uh, language. In fact, if you're gonna choose to start your venture on learning some of these five languages in the next five years, I think Groovy is gonna probably be the quickest one and the one you're going to enjoy right off the bat, okay? But I'm still daring you to learn all five of them. So that's, uh, that's Groovy, it's, it's actually dynamic typing or static typing, meaning let's take in Java, you have string A is equal to some sort of string. You could still do that in Groovy or you could choose just to do def A, hand signal code. <laughs> you could just do the def A with some sort of string or some sort of list or some sort of object along with it. So it's a really nice language. You can uh, choose to whatever types you want. They have closures, which are functions within Groovy, and it's an excellent language to work with. Um, the other one is JRuby. And you're probably thinking, gosh, what, uh, JRuby, where'd that one come from? Um, I think this one, I'm, pa I'm placing my bets on this one. I think it's gonna be useful because of all the wonderful tools that you can use with it. Currently I use, if you ever saw my slide deck, I use a tool called ASCII Doctor. Um, it's a way for me to just to use any editor to create slides right off the bat. Um, and uh, it uses uh, JRuby and Java in the back end to create my slide deck. I never have to use a PowerPoint or anything like that because it takes too much time. I'd rather just uh, type my slides out and, uh, and render them. So I'd be amiss of all these great tools if uh, I didn't know any of these extra languages. I could actually manipulate ASCII Doctor to whatever I need. There's another build tool called Builder. I don't know if any of you heard of Builder, Apache Builder. It's B-U-I-L-D-R. Uh, it's a wonderful build tool. Um, uh, a lot of developers do enjoy that, but that's all Ruby based. It's an entire build tool based on Ruby. Um, so there are a lot of great tools, and not only that, you can also use JRuby with a lot of tools that have already been developed under Ruby. A whole swath of great frameworks like Ruby on Rails that have been developed in the Ruby language, you could also use within the JVM. So I think for some of you, uh, uh, you're gonna enjoy JRuby a lot. There are a lot of great tools along with it. Um, I think probably as far as learning Ruby, Ruby takes on a different style. Um, but I think we are probably be looking at seven months to, to understand the language. And when I say learn these languages, I'm not talking about a really in-depth learning of these languages. I am talking about um, knowing these languages, know what the capabilities are. So in case you're in a pinch or in some sort of emergency and you're using these tools, you'll know how to get in there, change whatever you need to, design whatever you need to, and get out. So I think that's gonna be a very valuable asset in learning JRuby. Uh, the next one is my favorite one, and that is Scala. I really, really love Scala. I, I'd rather call that one the next Java than, uh, than Groovy. Uh, the reason I like that is because, uh, like Scala, is because it's very concise, it's very beautiful, it's a, it's a really great language, and it's very a static type, very much like Java is, with less typing. And the reason why there's less typing is because everything is type inferred. I don't have to explicitly declare everything because the compiler is going to work on my behalf. That is the absolute greatest thing about, or one of the greatest things about Scala. Um, I can manipulate a lot of things uh, within uh, the type system as well. So it's a very powerful language. One of the things that um, a lot of people state uh, when uh, discussing Scala is that it's a very hard language. And to that I'll say, oh, okay, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. 
Um, I liken Scala to a crane. Now, if I told you, uh, all right, here's a, here's a pile of cinder blocks, and I want you to take, a, uh, take these cinder blocks and put them up to the top of the roof. So you have two options. One, um, start lifting up the cinder blocks and, and go up the stairs with these cinder blocks one by one, or maybe if you're really strong, uh, two at a time. That's certainly one option. But of course, the other option is um, learn how to use a crane. Now, there's some learning curve to learning how to use a crane. Uh, you have to learn about weight, you have to learn about safety, you have to learn about wind, you have to learn about tension, you have to learn about the mechanics of the crane. So you have a lot to learn about it. And very much like Scala, you have a lot to learn about the language, but it will pay off in dividends much later. Um, so Scala is likely going to take you um, I don't know, probably a year and a half to two. It, it's actually a more difficult language to learn, but it is definitely worth the investment, okay? Uh, as far as Scala tools and a lot of uh, killer apps that are there within Scala, um, you probably heard of ACA. ACA is an actor system um, that uh, allows you to do concurrent applications, either on the local VM or on a remote VM. And the way that works is you send messages to these actors they get placed on a queue, a thread is dispatched to them and it's able to make your uh, computations or whatever you need to do asynchronously. Um, so that's a, a great framework that you can use. Um, uh, let's see, the other one is Play Framework. Uh, Play Framework is the uh, web framework that is available in Scala, a very popular web framework. Um, I would, should I say very easy to use? No, maybe not. I mean, every, fra every web framework has its, uh, has its own little difficulties. Um, so, on the Scala side, there are a lot of great applications that you can use. Uh, I'd hate for you to be uh, remiss of, of all that potential. Uh, Clojure is another great language. In fact, I think that's a really beautiful language uh, onto itself. And uh, Clojure is a list language, a, a list processing language. Uh, it is very much exactly like Lisp, plus or minus some features. Um, particularly features that, uh, that uh, um, you don't have to use as many parentheses as you do with the original Lisp. Um, this one I learned in about six months. I already had some experience with Scheme. I would say about six or seven months you'll probably get the core idea about how Clojure works. I would say, and this is just purely opinion on my part, I would say that uh, Clojure is beautiful if you do a lot of data processing. And uh, the reason is, is the language um, embraces pure lists, pure vectors, pure sets, and pure maps. And you wrangle the data using some of these uh, pure constructions. Um, and it's a functional language, very much like Scala is. Both Scala and Clojure embrace immutability, meaning that if, uh, if I were to describe it in uh, POJO terms, if you create a POJO, you don't have any setters and all the member variables are final. So uh, both of those languages embrace immutability. It allows you to reason a lot better what you're going to get in return um, using some of these languages. Well, I can't believe I haven't been using slides all this time. <laughs> um, so I, I think you're going to, uh, some of you are going to enjoy Clojure and uh, what some of the uh, killer apps that you will see with Clojure. One of them is Datomic, and it's kind of an interesting uh, project. Uh, take a look, it's uh, D-A-T-O-M-I-C. The idea behind Datomic is, let's take, for example, a relational database and you want to change the data, what happens? Well, you actually overwrite the data, right? I think for most SQL stores, you, you take a column and you change that data, and all of a sudden that change you made overrides whatever was there before. Now, think about version control uh, going out for a night drive with a relational database or any kind of uh, database. And uh, they get along with one another and they have kids. And uh, those kids are called, or one kid is called Datomic. <laughs> so with version control, if you change a row in a database, you have not only the current information, but all the changes before that. You have the version control behind it. I think that's gonna be a really huge app. 
uh, in, in the future. I think it's going to change the way we think about uh, data stores in general. So that's a, that's a really big app um, to look for as far as uh, Clojure goes. The other one's a Clojure script. Um, so there are languages that compile to JavaScript, and Clojure Script happens to be one of them. And it seems a lot of Clojurists really want to push that uh, push that idea. They think they really have a really good solution as uh, as far as a JavaScript type language that is developed, uh, obviously in another language. So look out for that one uh, for Clojure. And without slides, I'm, my brain's kind of keeping track of like where. <laughs> where the, uh, which one am I missing? I got JRuby, oh, Groovy. Um, so Groovy is now an Apache product that was announced uh, last week, I think, or even just a few days ago. Uh, Groovy used to be a part of Pivotal, uh, but Pivotal no longer financially supports the Groovy language. So now that's over at, uh, as an Apache incubator project. Um, and uh, Groovy's been around for quite a while. It was uh, first developed in tw uh, 2003 uh, by James Stra Strachan. Strachan. <laughs> and um, the language has, has been po very popular for the, for the last few years. Um, again, I think it's, it's, um, it's kind of a shame that people don't use Groovy as much as they should. Um, it is a very compelling language. Um, it is... Um, expressive, meaning that whatever you wish to express in code is e easy to do with Groovy. Um, and so there are some killer apps. One of them is Gradle. How many of you use Gradle as a build tool? Okay. Oh, okay, still a small fraction. So Gradle has, how many of you use Maven? All right, Maven is still pr uh, pretty dominant. Um, so Gradle, so what's wrong with Maven? So Maven has a lot of XML. And in order to do something flexible with it, you need a, you need a plugin for it. And you kind of have this, this need sometimes, and I'm sure all of you feel that when you use Maven, that you wish you could script some of this stuff that's within the build tool. So Gradle has that. It has a lot of the, it has a lot of the Maven plugins and, and different things like that. But it also has the ability to script things out just so you can get that flexibility. It's a wonderful build tool. Uh, take a look. And uh, probably that's one of the best ways to learn the Groovy language is to make that a part of your build. So Gradle is one of their killer apps. The other one is Grails, um, which um, uh, obviously was inspired by Ruby on Rails. It used to be called Groovy on, on what was it? It wasn't Groovy on Rails, it was called Groovy on Grails. Uh, but the Ru Ruby on Rails uh, folks decided to make a complaint about it, so it's now just Grails. You could download that, that framework from grails.org. How many of you use Grails? Okay. Now, the wonderful thing about Grails is that uh, it has a quick scaffolding. So you just quickly say what it is you need in a website, and it generates a whole hell of a lot for you. And all you have to do is just tweak the minor elements. So that's another great thing you're, you're a miss of. Uh, if you do not use uh, anything in Groovy, so take a look at that. Um, so let's see, Gradle, Grails, and I know I'm missing one. I forgot what it is. <laughs> There's Spock. Spock's a wonderful uh, testing framework. I don't think I'll ever get this. Uh, no, it's not uh, even up yet. Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see, how much time, time do I have? Yeah, let me think about that. Is that a possibility, do you know? What's that? Yeah, see, see if we could just uh, uh, directly attach it to there. Is that, okay, all right, we're going to find out. That's a great idea, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, where would I, um, that's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, scenario. So let's see here, how about I do, what's that? State the what? What he said? 
Oh, uh, that uh, to make a, a PDF and uh, just uh, post it somewhere, and then we could just all share since everyone, mostly everyone seems to be sharing a device, so we could uh, use that as a workaround. Give me a second here. Whoa. All right. There we are. It was, was it? It's on extended mode. There we go. All right, so there's my Roblo, uh, Roblo uh, one here. All right. Okay. So, uh, when I did my commercial, <laughs> uh, there's what I was talking about about uh, rejecting other ideas for other languages. Now I should have been able to do a shared mode on this screen here, um, but uh, uh, there we go. All right. So uh, let me continue with my uh, presentation then. Um, so, uh, pick up this book. This is an excellent book called The Pragmatic Programmer. And uh, if you've not read this one, it's a very great book and it tells you about learning a new language every year. And um, it's changed the way I, th I think about a lot of things uh, th uh, and the, the way I do programming today. So I learn a new language every year. Uh, just like they said, I have a scripting language uh, that I use. I, I use either uh, Ruby or Groovy now. Um, use that as your particular workhorse. Uh, know as many languages as you need to. Uh, know your IDE very well. Uh, and uh, choose an editor that you know very well. So uh, both of mine are Vim and IntelliJ. Those are my two favorite ones. And again, of course, learning a new language every year is extremely valuable. So uh, these are the languages uh, to learn. So Java works very well. It's a very well-cultivated language, and it brings us the money. And uh, so Lambdas in version 8 change the nature of the language and how we work with the language. Uh, and it brings us up to par with what other languages uh, have had for quite some while. Um, so learning some of the uh, block and lambda constructs in the other four languages, you might find that the Java 8 way of doing things is a little verbose. But are, are we to blame the Java engineers for all this kind of uh, verbosity? And really, the answer is no. So, Java is a language that we've had since 1995, and they try to make sure that everything is backwards compatible. And because of that, they have to make sure that everything they do is taken with care. And to retrofit it uh, with some of these advanced features is something that they cannot take lightly. Um, so they did so without breaking the core of the language and how we understand that, and I think up to this point, it's been a very good language for us. Um, so let's take a look at some of the ways that we do uh, functions uh, with Java 8. So some of you mentioned you don't use Java 8. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, some of you may not. So here's an interface with my predicate of generic type T. This is just a regular predicate uh, with a Boolean method called apply where we get uh, some kind of argument of type T. So given this now, now, I know this is already built into the language, but let's say I wanted to create my own particular predicate. So I have a method called my own filter where I'm bringing in a list and I'm gonna bring in that particular predicate. Now with this predicate, there's an apply term on here that I can just uh, decide whether uh, I can filter something out or not given a particular iterator. And then at the end, I'll just return the new results uh, as a copy, okay? Now, I can call my filter with the implementation, and we know this by our anonymous implementation, uh, my filter with uh, an arrays, and um, then I can just create that anonymously with a new predicate of integer, where we apply that one integer, and I could say, filter everything that is an odd number, okay? So this is up to maybe Java 7 without using the lambdas. But here's a rule about Java 8 lambdas. It's a functional interface that if you have one abstract method, um, you could have default methods or other static methods, but because it contains one abstract method, you could omit the name when you need to. Now, this does not include equals or hash code or anything that comes from a uh, Java Lang object or anything else inherited. So that's the definition of a functional interface. And as you can see here, there is only one abstract method, and that one's apply, okay? 
So can we use this? Absolutely, of course we can. So given this now, what I could do is I could take my filter, give it with a, uh, provide it with a list, and then with, with that list now, this is the same as that um, uh, anonymous, cl uh, anonymous uh, class instantiation that I had. Okay, so this is lambdas as we know now with Java 8, okay? But predicates and filtering are already built in with a catch. And here's the catch. So if I have an arrays of one, two, three, or four, and what I have to do in order to use a filter, so in this case here, I'm using the, the filtering mechanism that comes with Java 8. And in this case here, uh, given this list, I have to call a stream in order to filter it. And what I'm gonna get after this is a stream object that I then am going to use to filter that particular list. So this filter says for every element that is in this particular list, uh, filter out everything that is not odd, okay? Problem is, at this point right now, if you do a print line of this or a class name to figure out what's going on inside of it, I'm going to get a stream object called a reference pipeline. And that's kind of useless to me. What I want in return is the filtered list. So what do I have to do is I have to create a collector if I want to, but that comes at a cost. Here are the abstract methods for that particular collector. I need to implement an accumulator, characteristics, combiner, finisher, supplier, and that's too much work. So, thankfully, there are prefabricated collectors that I can use along with Java 8. So in this case here, I have a list with a stream filter, and I'm going to filter out all the odd stuff, and what I could do is say, Okay, now I have a stream object. What I'd like to do is recollect that again as a collection. So what I'm going to do here is recollect everything as a list. Or I could just do this as a custom collection. So on the bottom side here, what I have is I have arrays as list, stream, filter. Uh, I'm going to filter out all the odd information. And then finally here, I'm going to collect everything onto a tree set. So if there isn't a collection that I particularly like and I want to create my own collection, that's what I'll have to do. This is kind of verbose. So thankfully Java 8 has lambdas, but still it comes at a little bit of a cost. I have to collect everything again. So I could do my filtering, but I'm gonna have to place a collector there to collect it again uh, when I need to. So Java 8 is wonderful. You're going to get a lot of mileage out of it. But like I mentioned, there's still going to be a lot of typing along with it. So this is a lambda in Groovy. It's called a closure with an S, uh, closure C. And in this case here, we just create a block that will take an X. And uh, given that X, whatever X is, if there happens to be a modulo method on that particular X, I can ask whether this is odd or not. So given this closure, I can do a filter, but in, in uh, Groovy, it's called a grep. Uh, but there are no collectors, it's very simple. If I have a list of one, two, three, four, I can just call it grep with that particular closure, and everything works as expected. I could also inline it, okay? Very clean, very easy. If I have a list, by the way, I don't have to do a new array list or anything like that. If I just wanna create a list very quickly, in Groovy, uh, just one, two, three, four, grep, and in line I have a X modulo two, uh, and I determine whether um, I want to filter out all the odds or evens. In this case, I'm just filtering out all the odds, and that works as expected. But they have this really neat keyword called an it, and what this means is that uh, in that block there, that closure, we're gonna iterate through everything in the list and filter it every, uh, um, the things that pass or the things that don't. That block has to be a Boolean. So it's gonna go one at a time. So it's gonna do one, and one is going to be it for the first iteration. Second time around, two is gonna be it for the second iteration. So this is a case where I don't want to come up with a variable name if I don't want to, okay? So very easy, very concise to work with. Um, I could also collect. Now, collect may be known as map in other languages. So if I have a list, um, I can call collect. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply three to everything that is already onto that list. Okay? All right. So 
Let's take a look at another neat feature. This is uh, collections of mutability in Groovy. Uh, I am importing Groovy transform. That's going to allow me to do a canonical. Take a look at that class there. That's pretty nice. So by doing an at canonical on this particular class employee, this is going to create some uh, getters and setters for me. It's going to create uh, hash code. It's going to create everything uh, that I need. So let's say I'm creating uh, a stack of employees. So uh, this HW new employee, I'm going to create Handsome Wonderful, and, and Handsome Wonderful makes 40000 a year. Uh, I'm going to include him in a list. I'm going to include Sarah Stylish and Sylvia Sleek. Uh, both of those ladies make 50000 and $80,000. So one of the things that I could do is I could do something like this. Employees collect, which means that I'm going to uh, do the following and apply it to every one of the employees in this list. So every employee on this list, I want to take their salary and I want to add $10,000 uh, to those uh, employees' salary. I'm very generous. <laughs> All right, so given that now, uh, that print line is going to return the values of those salaries, 50000 60000 and 90000 But if I print the list, um, uh, what we'll see is that, or if I print the object, so in this case here, I'm printing out the object for Handsome Wonderful here. And we'll find out that he, he has received a $10,000 raise um, as well. Now, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this, but maybe you are. Um, this is a sign of mutability in the language. And sometimes you will get some surprises. I don't like these surprises that much, which is probably why I don't stick with Groovy all that much. Uh, but if you're comfortable with this and you think of this as more of a feature, then Groovy is the language uh, for you. So, as you can see here, um, um, the actual object itself has mutated as well as provided a list. Okay? So, there's also a spread operator. So, this is the spread operator. These two, the last slide was synonymous with this one. It's called star dot, and it's the spread operator. And the spread operator allows me to apply something to a list. So give me the entire list of employees. And for every employee that's in there, I want to change the salary by uh, adding $10,000 to it. Okay. Now here's JRuby. So JRuby has three different forms of functions. So what I'm showing you here are all the different forms of functions. There are blocks, procs, and lambdas. But I couldn't find an image for a proc, so I decided to use a croc. But uh, that's the idea here. All right. So here's a block in Ruby or JRuby. So given an array, so uh, JRuby does not have lists, they have arrays. So I'm going to do an array select, and select allows me to do filtering. And this is just one way I can do this. I can use a do block, and for each x, um, I want to determine whether this is odd or not. Or the other thing that I could do is I can use this sort of block. Okay? These are blocks, and it makes the programming language uh, very concise by using some of these blocks. Now, how do the blocks work? So let's take a look at this example here. So I have, uh, in this case, I have def, which is the way we create methods in JRuby, and I have a call block. Within this call block, I have a call to yield. So this means for whatever block I receive within this method, I'm going to yield the information onto that block. So in there I have yield with the string hello and the number 99. So if I call this method call block uh, with this block, I have string number. And so when I yield hello and 99, string and num in this uh, particular call right here will be replaced with hello and 99. Puts his print line in, J, in JRuby and Ruby. And what this is going to uh, turn into is that I'm going to print out hello with a space and that number I'm just going to convert to a string. That's their method of doing so. Okay? Uh, so uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is just to do it in line just like this. Call block do with the arguments and print out the, uh, the string. Okay? So as you can see here, a lot of things kind of stay the same even though we're using different languages. Okay. So I could do multi-line if I want to. It doesn't have to all occur on the same line, and I could just keep going if I need to. Okay. So JRuby is uh, very easy. So um, there's also procs. 
So here's the situation. Right now, this does not work, or it never does work in, in Ruby. If I have a call block and I have a yield, all that doesn't, uh, doesn't change. I can't do this. Like, I can't assign a block to a variable and reuse it multiple times like I have on those last two lines. It should, but it doesn't, because blocks don't work that way. So what we need, in turn, is we need to use uh, either the at uh, and block there, and what that's going to do is it's going to convert that into a proc for us to use. So they have different ways to do this. Um, and so what's going to happen here is that this is going to turn this particular block into a proc object so that we can use that. So now we can do a call block uh, with either one of those and uh, bring those in. And because of that, what we can do now is we can do a, uh, instead of a block like this, which didn't work, we could do something like this. So a proc is something that allows us to convert a block to something that is an object unto its own and that which we can reference. So this proc here now, uh, I can assign it to a variable. And now given that variable now, I can call this method with that particular block. Okay? So that's what a proc is. Proc is uh, something that is going to be an object that I can reference and that I could send to a method. So JRuby and Ruby also have lambdas. So here's a lambda. This is a def lambda method. And within this method, I have this call called internal lambda. All I have to do, what's really nice about JRuby is I don't even have to put a def or a, a val or anything like that. I just, if I want to make an assignment, I can make an assignment like internal underscore lambda and assign that to some sort of value, in this case, lambda return four. So this is just gonna return four from this particular lambda. So if I call this lambda, one of the nice things that this will do is that it will print out starting, it will make the call to this lambda, print out four, and it would also continue along with uh, the rest of the code. Um, the others do not do that, so that's, uh, that's gonna be the difference between a lambda and procs. So this is what a proc looks like when it's returned. So take a look at the difference between this and this. So as you see here, the lambda keeps going down the stack. Starting, we'd make the call to that internal lambda, which brings us four, and finally we have the ending, okay? Now within, within here, this is a proc. So if I make a call with, or if I create the proc on the first line inside of this proc method, puts uh, will print line a starting, and then what we're going to have next is we're gonna make the call to this particular proc. At which time, all we get is starting and four. So uh, procs in Ruby will always return, whereas lambdas will return, but will continue down the stack. So those are the two differences. So that may be probably the most complicated thing as far as Ruby's concerned. To me, that may be a little bit shaky just to deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the rest of Ruby is a, is a great language to work with. Um, so in this case here, uh, I'm doing a proc with string interpolation. So given an x, y, z, I'm just going to print out x is x, y is y, and z is z. And um, um, when I do that, call read block, given a proc, that block call will provide uh, information. So in this case, what I have here is I have block call four and three. But take a look at this. Right here, I'm accepting three arguments. So one of the things that you can get with a proc is that it has no problem doing this. All it's going to do is just omit the Z. But lambdas, on the other case, if I call this read block with a lambda, I'm going to get a exception uh, based off of that, okay? So they have really weird rules when it comes to functions and you would have to deal with that. So they have three different ones and that's up to you if, you, uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Now, closure. This is why I mean that, uh, to me, I think closure is a very beautiful language. So take a look at this. This is how we def define, they call this a function, def and a function. Uh, you could think of it as a method if you like. Def and will say, so average is going to be the method name if you want to think of it that way. 
Um, what comes next is a vector of the different variables for this particular method or function. So in this case here, it's going to be numbers. Now, closure is dynamic typing, so numbers can be anything. So in this case here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to apply addition to all the numbers. So what that's going to do is it's going to apply um, addition to everything. So it's going to accumulate all the numbers. On the second group here, I'm going to take account of all the numbers that are available. And of course, I'm going to divide. The thing is, when you start to learn closure, is that the operator is here on the left hand side. Okay? What I'm doing here with this apply is I'm actually calling apply with two arguments. One's the function, and the function's called it plus, and the second argument is numbers. Count, so you're very much used to saying, like if you have a list, list.size. In this case, you do count is on the first one, because that's what we want to operate on, and numbers is going to be synonymous with uh, the object or what you want to operate on. So if I provide it with an average of 1.0, 3.0, 10.4, 11.5, uh, that, uh, that will work uh, just fine. So here's another one. So take a look at this one. I have def and op. So the name of the method is op. And I have F, A, and B. And F, A, and B could be whatever it is. And as long as it makes sense semantically, it's going to perform whatever it needs to do. So what can I do with this? Take a look at this. I'm sending op. So in other words, I'm calling op the method. I'm providing it a function. This function takes two numbers. And A is going to be 4, and B is going to be 2. Given that now, what I can do is provide that plus here where it has the F, and it's going to perform the operation whenever need be. So the thing I really like about closure is that you are forced to think about high order functions. Whereas other languages are like, nah, you don't have to use functions if you don't want to, you can go about it your old way. But closure is going to force the way you think. And I think this is gonna have a very uh, positive effect on the way you do development. Here's a inline anonymous function. So I'm gonna call map, which is actually the, the correct functional name to do this kind of operation. In line, I'm gonna have this term fn with a vector of i, meaning that for every i I get, I want to take that and multiply it by two. This is kind of, uh, when you think about this, this kind of looks like your old HP calculators with the uh, reverse Polish notation, same thing. So given this i,